it is difficult to imagine such a comfort on the ridge, with shrill, howling wind hundreds of kilometers away from human settlements. Some things are too frightening to think about. Sometimes we push these things out of our heads in a desperate attempt to avoid the fear. Other times, the lack of answers is worse. We think of the impossible, the unbearable, the absolute worst thing, and still, we manage to extend that to a new level of horror. For the last almost 60 years, people have done exactly that in the case of the Diet Love Hikers. They died sometime between February 1st and 2nd in 1959 in the Ural Mountains, in what is now Russia, but was at the time the Soviet Union. This case remains one of the most strange unsolved mysteries. If you listen to our episode featuring the Summerton Man, you'll remember that there were many clues, but no real answers. In this case, there are again many clues, but the clues don't seem to connect to any logical conclusions. The group was well-educated and experienced, but they still managed to encounter something, someone, a moment, that created chaos from which they could not recover. Hello? Welcome. This is Please. the two cities. Oh, I'm so excited. Welcome to this special episode, which will focus on the mysterious case of the Diet Wolf Pass. I first learned the story of the Diet Love Pass in an episode of one of my favorite podcasts, Astonishing Legends. Scott and Forrest covered the story in great detail, but all I could think about was the many nights that I'd spent sleeping in a tent on a mountain next to a lake or near a creek, isolated from other people, but feeling a sense of safety in the backcountry. Somehow, being in the middle of nowhere doesn't feel like nowhere when you're there on a backpacking trip, camping, hiking, exploring. It's as if the motivation of the adventure removes the absence of place. But then again, I think back to the nights when I couldn't fall asleep. One night in particular, I woke violently from a horrific nightmare. I remembered feeling compressed, isolated, and in danger. It was dark, but the stars illuminated the outside of the tent. I immediately recognized that if there was something outside, I would see it. But before I could check for a possible threat, I clenched my eyes shut and pulled my sleeping bag over them. There was something more horrifying about knowing that there was something there than not knowing. It's that same feeling you get in bed when you feel something might be in the darkest corner of your room, in your closet or under your bed. So you pull the blankets over your head. Knowing would be worse and hiding makes you feel safe. I lie there for two hours trying to talk myself down. I couldn't shake the story of the Diet Love Pass, the intense fear these individuals must have felt. More, I recognized that their skill, preparedness, and knowledge meant nothing when whatever happened, happened. These people met their fate in what can only be assumed was a gruesome and painful way leaving a scene from which we can only draw more questions than answers. The group diary received a final entry. I wonder what awaits us on this hike. Will anything new happen? It was 1959, and Igor formed a group of nine for a skiing trip across the northern Urals in what was then the Soviet Union. Igor was a radio engineering student at the Ural Polytechnic University, now Ural Federal University, and many of the group were his peers, consisting of Igor, Yuri Doroshenko, Ludi Dubinina, Georgi Krivonoshenko, Alexander Sasha Kolivetov, Zina Komogrova, Rustam Rustik Slobodin, Nikolai Thribionovs, and Simon Alexander Zolotoryov. All but one, Simon, who was 38, was between 20 and 24. Each member of the group were grade two hikers with ski tour experience. They were embarking on the trip to achieve a grade three certification. This was, at the time, the highest level of certification in the Soviet Union. 
This required them to travel 300 kilometers, or 190 miles. The original party of eight men and two women were aiming to reach Otorten, a mountain just 10 kilometers, or 6.2 miles, from the site of the incident. The group began their trip on January 25, 1959, at Ivdel, a city center in the northern province of Svidolovsky. They took a truck to Vizai, where they ate loaves of bread to prepare for the next day and spent the night before embarking on their trek. On January 27th, they began their trip. The initial group of 10 became the final group of nine when Yuri Yudin, who suffered from several health issues, was forced to turn back after joint pain that made him too uncomfortable to hike. The group kept diaries and cameras, which were found in the campsite, and it has made understanding their route possible. On January 31st, they arrived at a highland area and began to prepare for climbing. The next day, they moved through the next pass. It seems as though they had planned to get over that pass and camp on the other side the next night. But vicious weather made it impossible. They faced snowstorms and limited visibility. They lost their direction and deviated westward toward the top of the mountain. They had realized they were off route and they stopped to set up camp, but they were on a slope. For whatever reason, they chose not to move the 1.5 kilometers, which is less than a mile downhill, to a forested area, which would have provided more shelter. Yuri, the member who had turned back, believed that Igor likely did not want to lose the altitude that they had gained, and instead chose to practice camping on the slope. Igor had promised to send a message to their sports club as soon as they had returned to Vizai. It was expected no later than February 12th. But Igor told Yuri when he turned back that he now anticipated it would be longer. When the 12th came and went, no one was concerned. Delays were common and Igor had already anticipated that the group would be late. But by February 20th, relatives of the members of the group were demanding a rescue operation. The head of the institute sent the first rescue groups made up of volunteers and teachers. Army and militia groups joined the effort with planes and helicopters later. Two weeks after their anticipated return, their abandoned and badly damaged tent was recovered. The campsite was a mystery to the search party. Mikhail Sherevin, the student who found the tent, said, quote, The tent was half torn down and covered with snow. It was empty, and all the group's belongings and shoes had been left behind. It was determined that the tent had been cut from the inside. This means that the campers were cutting themselves out of the tent rather than someone else cutting their way in. Also, footprints showed that as they fled, most were wearing only socks or were barefoot. There were only a few instances of one shoe print, but just one. Remember, this is February in the Soviet Union. It was cold and they were camped there because of an intense storm which kept them from summiting. The footprints led down toward the woods of the opposite side of the pass, and they were less than a mile to the northeast. It was at the forest edge that the first visible remains were found. The bodies of Yuri Krivonoshenko and Yuri Doroshenko were found shoeless, dressed only in their underwear with the remains of a small fire. The branches on the nearby tree were broken up to five meters, suggesting one of them had climbed up to look for something, perhaps camp, or maybe to escape something. Between the camp and the tree, they found three more bodies, Igor, Zina, and Rustik. The bodies suggested that they were attempting to return to the tent. They were found at varying distances, 300, 480, and 630 meters from the tree. But the remaining four hikers were not found immediately. It took more than two months for the snow to melt. On May 4th, under four meters of snow, in a ravine 75 meters further into the woods from the pine tree, the final four bodies were discovered. These four were wearing more than their counterparts. There was evidence that the clothing of the first victims was taken and used in an attempt to survive. Simone was wearing Luda's faux fur coat and hat, while Luda's foot was wrapped with a piece of Yuri Krivonashenko's wool pants. The lack of clothing can be explained by paradoxical undressing, a process in which the body begins to burn, 
due to extreme hypothermia. So while they were freezing and in desperate need of warmth, their bodies were reacting with the same sensation of heat, so intense that they removed their clothing, only assisting in their demise. A medical examiner found no injuries that would have been fatal in the initial five bodies. Instead, it was determined that they had all died of hypothermia. Rustic was found to have had a small crack in his skull, though it was not believed to be fatal. After the discovery of the four others in May, it shifted the view of the case. Three of these hikers had fatal injuries. Nikolai had major damage to his skull, while both Ludi and Simon had major chest fractures. Dr. Boris Vosredeni cited that the force required to cause such damage would have been comparable to a car crash, though, curiously, the bodies had no external damage related to any of the fractures, as if they would have been subject to high levels of pressure. Though, the other damage was apparent, especially in Ludi. She was missing her tongue, eyes, and part of her lips, as well as facial tissue and part of her skull. Her hands were also whitened due to excess moisture, which caused some to postulate that she had, perhaps, been face down in a stream, which would have aligned with her external injuries, though this was likely post-mortem. It was very cold, between negative 13 to negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit, with a storm blowing, likely making it feel much colder. The dead were only partially clothed. Some were barefoot, others were only in socks. Some were found in pieces of others' clothing, likely the clothes of the members of their group who had already passed. Soon, the information in the inquest was published. It was made public that six of the group members died of hypothermia, while the other three died of fatal injuries. There was absolutely no evidence of other people in the area. The tent was ripped from the inside. The victims died between six and eight hours after their last meal. Tracing the patterns, all of them left the camp of their own accord on their own two feet. There were no survivors. At this point, the only thing that was sure was that they had all died, and the best cause was a compelling natural force. The inquest officially closed in May 1959, as there's a lack of a guilty party. The files were sent to a secret archive, and it wasn't until the 1990s that photocopies became available, though many parts were missing. People believed that the inquest was rushed, and a lack of access to the files was part of a government conspiracy, maybe to hide the truth of the tragic event. It's been suggested that it was a military accident. Perhaps a parachute mine caused the severe damage to the bodies of the hikers. The mystery of what happened to these nine people remained, and people began to speculate about what it could have been. Some suggested that the indigenous Mansi people may have attacked the group for encroaching on their territory, but the nature of the group's dead didn't fit. The footprints were alone, without footprints of an attacker. There was no evidence of a struggle with another human, and Dr. Vosredeni stated that another human being could not have caused the soft tissue damage found in the victims. Yuri Kensevich, a 12-year-old at the time, attended five of the hikers' funerals. He recalled their skin being a strange, deep brown color. Another hiking group mentioned that there was a strange orange sphere in the sky. It was just to the north of the incident. Some believe that these may have been some type of governmental chemical or nuclear testing that were left out of the inquest in an attempt to protect Soviet secrets. Various other witnesses have come forward in years past, too scared to come forward at the time. Radiological weapons have been suggested due to small amounts of radioactivity found on some of the clothing and bodies. While Yuri described their skin as being brown, family members called it orange and claimed that their hair was gray. Though radioactive dispersal would have affected all of the hikers and their stuff, not just a few, and their hair and skin discoloration is a natural part of the mummification process, which, after months of exposure to cold and winds, was impossible to avoid. Donnie Eicher's book, Dead Mountain, suggests the winds were at fault. His hypothesis argues that the wind going around the mountains created a Karman vortex, which is capable of producing infrared sound, which 
is known to induce panic attacks in human beings. Eicher suggests that the sound is created as wind passes over the mountain, which would have caused physical discomfort and emotional distress. The panic could have caused them to slit the tent and flee. He believes that once out of range of the sound, they would have been far enough away from their tent that in the dark, they wouldn't have been able to find it. And having faced serious injuries, many of them would have remained in the cold too long to survive. Others believed it was an avalanche that caused them to flee. Benjamin Radford suggests, quote, the group woke up in a panic and cut their way out of the tent, either because of an avalanche that had covered the entrance to the tent or because they were scared that an avalanche was imminent. Better to have potentially repairable slit in the tent rather than risk being buried alive in it under tons of snow. They were poorly clothed because they had been sleeping and ran to the safety of the nearby woods where trees would help slow oncoming snow. In the darkness of the night, they got separated into two or three groups. One group made fire while the others tried to return to the tent to recover their clothing. Since the danger had apparently passed, but it was too cold and they all froze to death before they could locate the tent in the darkness. At some point, some of their clothes may have been removed or swapped from the dead, but at any rate, the group of four whose bodies were most severely damaged were caught in an avalanche and buried under four meters or 13 feet of snow, more than enough to account for the compelling natural force the medical examiner described. But, Still, many have cited that an avalanche is unlikely. The location didn't have any obvious signs of an avalanche. The bodies that were found within 10 days were under a shallow layer of snow, and their bodies would have been swept much further from the campsite. Also, over 100 expeditions have happened since the incident, in which there has never been an avalanche condition reported. Not to mention, Igor and Alexander were both studying for their master's certificate in ski instruction and would never have allowed the group to hike in an area that was prone to avalanche. Of course, in 2014, a Discovery Channel special suggested that the group may have been killed by a mink or a Russian yeti. While there's an image that was found in the group's photos of what appears to be a yeti-like creature, most believe it was simply one of the group poking fun at the legend. The Discovery Channel special suggests that the Yeti could have caused the injuries sustained, as it would have required a superhuman power to have caused such damage. Of course, the episode concludes by explaining that there is no evidence to support this claim. So, the mystery remains. Just this year, on April 12, 2018, the remains of Simone were exhumed upon request by journalists of a Russian tabloid. Contradicting results were found. Experts stated that the injuries were similar to that of a person hit by a car, and that the DNA did not match any living relative. It was then discovered that the name of Simone was not listed on those buried at the cemetery where the group was laid to rest. Though a reconstruction of the man's face matched the photographs of Simone, and journalists still believe that he could have been a man living under Simone's name to hide in post-war time. After the incident, the pass was renamed Dyatlov Pass after Igor, the group's leader. And while the area is accessible today, it was closed to expeditions for three years after the incident. So, for now, the details of their deaths remain a mystery. An unknown, compelling force, vague and unsatisfying, is our only answer. While numerous theories have been suggested, discredited, and reinvigorated, we really are left with only questions. And while what little of a story we know, the truth of the story is chilling. What's worse is that no matter how horrid you imagine it to be, it was probably worse. Thanks for listening to this special episode. We love hearing from you, so don't hesitate to contact us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or email us at tales of the number two cities podcast at gmail.com. Please rate, review, and subscribe on the listening platform of your choice. We also have merch that's available at tpublic.com. That's T E E P U B L I C.com and a Patreon page. Many people are asking for more and longer episodes, and we want to give them to you. 
Your Patreon pledges will make this a reality. Thank you for those who have pledged and or bought merch. We appreciate the extra support. But most of all, thank you for tuning in. Until next time.